How do you design enterprise networks? What are the principles? What are the items you need to be concerned about and overlook? This is what we're going to see in this video. Welcome to another networks learning session. In this session, we will go through some of the enterprise design principles, starting with hierarchy, where we will look at the functionality of the different layers. We will look at modularity, specifically the access block, and we will look at the flexibility and how to introduce virtualization in the network. So we will look at VLANs and VRFs. And finally, we will look at resiliency. So first hop routing protocol and virtual switch system. Let's get started. Before you design any network, you need to know what you are designing for. Applications are the main drivers for how networks should be designed. The applications will very often have some requirements in terms of jitter and delay and, and packet drops and so forth. Then you also need to consider security in your design, virtualization services, and most importantly, and one of the most important items is also the high availability. So you need to have a design that will sustain outages without a high impact on your customers or clients. To achieve this type of designs, you need to have some principles you have to adhere to. So the principles, the general principles for enterprise campus designs are hierarchy. They would be layers that you have to design separately and each layer will address a specific functionality. Modularity, so you will have different module in your overall network design. So you can manage these modules without interfering with other modules or without having to redo your whole network design. And then you need your network to be flexible. So you are in a position to do upgrades in your network, for example, or you need to, you need to be able to introduce in your routing protocols without having to change hardware design, new features and so forth. And finally, you need to have a resilient network. So again, we're back to the high availability where your network, no network is perfect and there will be outages in your network, but you want your network to be designed to sustain and to survive outages. So with regards to hierarchy, the classic common model is the three tier model. And it consists of an access layer, a distribution layer, and a core layer. In the access layer, this is where your hosts your access switches will be connected. Your, it could be a set of floors. It could be, this could be building A in a campus. This could be building B. So this will be your access layer. And then you'll have your distribution layer, which is a set of probably layer three switches that will be talking layer two downstream and then layer three upstream. And then you will have your core layer. So this is the common, very well known three tier model. But you also have designs where the core and the distribution are actually collapse and you end up with two tier model only. So this will be your collapsed core design. So when do you use the three or when, when is it recommended to use the two tier model instead of the three tier model? It pretty much depends on the size of your distribution layout. So we will take a look at one of the reasons why you would have to use or is recommended to use a three tier model. The functionalities for each access or for each layer, starting with the access layer, are security. For your access layer, this is your first, this is your security perimeter. This is your secure boundaries. And this is where you very often have your quality of service marking. So you need to mark the, park, the packets that are coming in because you don't trust what happens somewhere in here. So this is where you'll be doing your quality of service marking. This is also where you will have your security, your access list. Very often, this layer is very rich in, in features. Then you will have your distribution layer. This is where you will have your aggregation of routes, your aggregation of links. Here, the aggregated links, for example. This will be the demarcation between your access and your core layer. Distribution will very often also happen at this layer. You will also have quality of service. It's not because you have quality of service in the access that you will not have it anywhere else in the network. So a common design for quality of service is that you will have your marking happening 
at the axis and then action will be taken on the distribution layer based on the markings that happen on the axis layer. Then finally you have your core layer. This layer, although very and the most critical layer, it has to be very simple. You don't want your core layer to do too much thinking and you don't want it to be too complex. You want it to be simple so we can switch packet as fast as possible. You also want a high availability in this layer. So not just in terms of redundant link as we see here, but you also want each node to have, for example, dual power supply. You want it to have two root processor unit, two RSPs. So you want it to be fully redundant in terms of hardware also. In one of the previous slides we were discussing, should we have a two tier layer or three tier? So this is one of the reasons why you would want to have a three tier layer. These are distribution boxes or blocks. They need to be fully meshed. And this is a lot of links which means there's a lot of ports that will be used in every switch or every router in here. So one approach to reduce the number of links in between distribution boxes is to actually have a core layer. One of the things that this design is providing is avoiding to have links between every distribution box in the network. So instead of connecting to every distribution box, you only connect to the core boxes and the core boxes will connect together. So it reduces the number of links between distribution boxes. This would be one of the reasons why you will choose to have a three tier instead of a two tier model. So if your distribution layer, if you don't have too many sites for your distribution, you could go ahead and have a two tier model. But if you have too many boxes or too many uh, sites for your distribution layer, then you are better off having a core layer in the middle for the aggregation of the distribution layer. Now we're looking at modularity and what it provides. So we have in this example, we have a core block, we have an access block, we have our internet block, data center block and one block. So these blocks, although they look very similar, they have a distribution and access in most of them, they give us a lot of flexibility in terms of fault isolation. So if there is a fault in the access block, we don't have to go troubleshooting in the WAN or in the data center. And also the fault is limited to the access block, is not impacting the WAN or the DC or the internet. It also optimizes the operations. So if I want, for example, to do an upgrade on this router here on the internet block, I don't have to worry about the access block layer or the WAN block, for example. If I want to replace a box in the data center, I don't have to worry about the access block. It also gives us the opportunity to use module replication. So say, for example, this is building A for the access block, and I want to extend the same design to another building B. So a new building B has been acquired and they have staff in there or another department. I just have to copy paste this access block and have it here. So I will have my two links, distribution, and then I'll have my access switches here. Simple. So I'm basically just replicating this access block as a different module, if you like. In terms of routing, this also, this particular design or this setup of having the mod modularity helps us to have a better routing design. So in this case, we map very well to OSPF. I could have my OSPF area zero for the core and the other building or access blocks or internet block, DC block, WAN block, they will be in a different OSPF area. So this is some of the advantages of having this modularity. It gives us flexibility, fault isolation, better management of our network. Now let's look at the access distribution block. This can be quite complex for the simple reason that there are different ways we can do this. One of the first challenges is that it will be layer two, which means that we will have to rely on spanning tree protocol. So looking at the first option, loop free U topology here, you don't have any loops in terms of layer two. So layer three is between the two distribution boxes and the two access switches are running layer two, but there is no loop, which means that you don't really need spanning tree, but it is recommended that you will still rely on spanning tree protocol. 
The next one is the loop square topology. So here we have a loop, which means that we have to use spanning tree protocol to avoid having loops and so forth. As you can see, not all links are used. You have some links that would be blocked, so you can't utilize these. An important thing to bear in mind here is that since you have your STP route here, it could well be that your traffic will go and cross the, the inter-distribution links before it exits out, which is not optimal. And then we have the loop-free inverted view. So here again, we are using layer two. All the links are in layer two, but we don't have a loop as such. So one of the problems with this design or this topology is that there is single point of failure. So if you have hosts sitting on this switch, let's call it switch B, if this link fails or this distribution router or switch fail, you actually lost connectivity for all of these hosts. This is not the case for this scenario, the first scenario or the second scenario here, because you have a, a closed square or ring, you still have a way to get out to the internet or to your data center. You don't have a single point of failure. And the final setup here or final topology is loop triangle. Again, since we have a loop and we have layer two, we are relying on spanning tree protocol. It's not a problem as such, but it is a concern. We have two links which are blocked, which means that we have links that we don't actually utilize at all. But on the other hand, the convergence is faster. So from this switch here, hosts that are on this switch, they will hit the STP root switch within one hop instead of having to go via two hops, as was the case for the previous designs. One of the methods to avoid relying on spanning tree protocol is to use virtual switch system, VSS. So what does VSS do? Essentially, VSS will allow us to turn two different switches and get them to act as one. So in this scenario, you have a link aggregation protocol running on these two links. This is a multi-chassis lag. It's an MC lag. Traditionally, what we have if we have link aggregation protocol between two devices. So you will just bundle these two links. But in this particular case, your link aggregation is going over two separate devices. So if you hear on the right, and you have your two links, you can actually bundle these two here, these two links. So it's the same configuration as you would do for a normal link aggregation. But in this scenario, you are terminating your far end onto two different nodes, but there will be some signaling between these two switches so they actually act as one. Effectively, you end up having this logical topology where the two switches appear as one and your links or your aggregated links over the two switches appears as two single links. As you can see, there is no layer two loops which means that both links are utilized. You're not wasting your bandwidth. You're using both links at the same time. You're load balancing, and you also have a better uptime because convergence in this scenario is a lot faster than the first one here. So this is why VSS is very recommended in the access distribution layer. Flexibility. Your network should be flexible, so you should be in a position to make changes to it, adding new features or new routing and so forth, without having to redesign it. You should also be able to add a new forwarding protocol, such as RPv6, without having to make changes to your design. You should also be able to support traffic management. Traffic separation should be supported. So this is virtualization. You should be able to virtualize your network again without having to introduce new devices or make drastic changes to your network. So speaking of virtualization, assume you have a building A here where you have a switch and different VLANs. And this switch here connects to your core layer, which is a layer three. And then you need to deliver those same VLANs into a different building or different access block. So you have to take your VLANs, which are layer two, you have to transport them over layer three and then hand them over to another layer two access. 
how do we achieve this? And this is, this is a common requirement where you have different departments over different buildings in a campus. And the requirement is to keep that separation of traffic. So you start with VLANs where you're separating your accounting departments and your marketing and sales and your engineering department. And you want to transport that to another building where you have some other team members. So one of the ways of doing this is to use virtual routing and forwarding instances, VRF. So this can be used in two versions. There's the VRF Lite. And then you can use the MPLS VPN-based VRF. MPLS is very often used in ISPs, but we are seeing that more and more enterprise networks are relying on MPLS. So back to how we transport these VLANs from one end to the other over layer three. With VRF, we are creating some small routing or small routers, and each router has a separate routing table than the other. So this creates a separation in the routing table. You, you can, at the end of the day, have even a default route in every VRF. Every VLAN maps to a VRF. This is transported over your core and then delivered on the other building. And it is symmetrical. So you will also take on VLANs on the, from the right side, transport them over your core and deliver them to your other building. But you're keeping the separation and the mapping of VLAN to VRF, VRF to VLAN. In terms of configuration, this is pretty simple. You have your three VLANs that will be trunked using 802.1Q. Your VLANs are transported to your layer 3 switch. You will terminate each VLAN in a .1Q sub-interface. So this will be separate sub-interfaces, layer 3 sub-interfaces for each VLAN. Each sub-interface is then associated with a VRF. So this could be the VRF for 100, VRF for 200 and 300. And this is more likely routed and then the same thing will happen at the far end router close to the building B. Now let's take a look at resiliency. There are different ways of ensuring resiliency in your network. So let's just talk about a few of the common methods. One of the common methods is link aggregation. It comes in two standards, LSCP, which is the IEEE standards, and port aggregation protocol, which is the Cisco standards. But at the end of the day, they will achieve the same thing. So one switch, one device connected with three different links. These three links are bundled. So they are aggregated to actually act as one logical link. You can bundle up to eight links. One recommendation here is that when you pick in your ports, so if, say for example, this node here has two line cards, try to spread your ports over the line cards. So you, maybe you will have two on the first line card and the last link will be on here for the simple reason that if the line card fails, at least you will have one link that will remain in production. Then first hop routing protocol. So this we'll see in the next slide, but essentially what first hop routing protocol does, it will protect your gateway. So in case this router fails, your gateway, your logical gateway will shift to the next available distribution box. Based on your configuration, your active gateway would be on this node and the standby gateway would be on the other node. This is for HSRP, for example. And finally, one of the recommendations is if you have to use spanning tree protocol, try not to not rely on the normal plain spanning tree. Try to upgrade or enhance your setup by using rapid per VLAN spanning tree because the convergence is a little bit faster than the traditional 50 seconds and some other features are actually active by default. So for first hop routing protocol, it comes in different options. We have the Cisco standard HSRP, IEEE standard virtual redundancy routing protocol. And then we have the gateway load balancing protocol, which is again a Cisco standard. So these two HSRP and VRRP operate in more or less the same way. You will have an active gateway and a standby gateway. 
and failure of one device will actually trigger that the gateway moves or shifts to the other to the other node you can also do some tracking so if this link fails your gateway will shift to the other node there's i have done a video previously on hsrp and done a demo and configuration and validation using packet sniffing and so forth one of the recommendations here when you are using hsrp or vrrp you have to align your stp route with the primary or active gateway the reason for this is you want your stp route to be the same node that is your active gateway else you will end up having this type of traffic so you will have your you will have your frames coming in all the way to the stp route and then crossing the inter distribution links to then hit your data center or go to the internet and so forth so it's very important to align your stp route it will not always be possible because things will change but at least this should be your baseline when you design So that was the last slide in this session. I hope you have enjoyed it and thank you for watching. <music>